Hello, I'm Caroline Jones. It's seven years now since a young American woman died while scuba diving with her husband on the Great Barrier Reef. Tina and Gabe Watson were on their honeymoon. Yet, after a tenacious police investigation, Gabe Watson was charged with his wife's murder. What happened next sparked public anger, both here and in the United States, with ongoing disquiet about the role of the prosecutors. It remains a baffling case, and tonight, for the first time, the detectives involved outline the evidence against Gabe Watson. This is the story of Tina Watson. It was a beautiful day, uh, the day that she got married. Tina and I had a very nice conversation on the way to the church. I told her over and over how much that I loved her and that I wanted her to be happy. Uh, I also told her that if she had any doubts about this, she didn't have to do it. Do you, Gabe and Tina? And she told me, she said, Dad, this is going to be a good day. This is what I want. will bind you as husband and wife. So I think I cried from then until all the way through the wedding. Hi, Gabe. Hi, Gabe. Choose you, Tina. Choose you, Tina. From this I just had this fear, this uncomfortable feeling that even though she had said she was sure that she wasn't. And I truly felt like he wouldn't take care of her the way that she deserved to be taken care of. The last time that I saw her was at the end of the wedding reception. I ran to the elevator and actually got my arm stuck in the door to force it back open so I could just grab her one more time. And I told her I loved her. And then I looked at Gabe and I touched his arm and I said, take care of my little girl. And, uh, and that's the last few seconds that I had with her. Station on Monday, the 27th of October 2003. Other persons present are Gabe Watson and uh, his mother. Well, when Detective Garinger and I were assigned the investigation, I could not see how Tina's death would be suspicious. Tina's gone down, I need help. Tina's gone down, I need help. Gabe was married only 11 days to Tina, so we seemed quite happy with each other. But basically, we, we kept coming back to the point there was no reasonable hypothesis as to why. Tina died underwater on that given day. The doctor said oh, I did everything I could, but we lost her. We were looking for innocent explanations, but at the end of the day, there were just too many lies, too many inconsistencies. I honestly think that just prior to her death, um, she was fighting for her life. Tina was just the most beautiful girl, both inside and out. And she could walk into a room and, and just light the whole place up. You know, she loved life, and she made life fun. Uh, she made life fun for all of us. Tina met Gabe in classes at college, probably together about a year before they got engaged. He worked for his dad as a salesman for the cardboard company. One day when we're sitting in the rocking chairs on the front porch at the uh, rest stop, <laughs> <laughs> wiping the drool off each other's chins. <laughs> I can't think of anybody else ever <laughs> Tina and Gabe were married. So when she said she was taking up scuba diving, I was like, crazy ladies say what? Good in alphabet. <laughs> Because her hair stayed wet for so long, she didn't like getting it wet. <laughs> when we would go swimming in high school, she'd be doing this really crazy dog paddle swim <laughs> just so that her head would stay above the water. I had talked to him about my concern about the diving lessons, about the fact that she had had, uh, you know, a heart problem as a child. And he said if Tina wanted him to do the things that, that she liked to do, that she had to do the things that he wanted to do, and he liked to dive, so she needed to dive with him. 
I have to get before shots in case we get eaten by a shark. For the honeymoon, he wanted to go to Australia and see the turtles and go scuba diving. She thought that would be exciting. Tell the camera bye. Bye, camera. Blow the camera a kissy. But it certainly wasn't the first place I would have expected her to pick. Tina, where are we going? We're going to the Z. Oh, yeah. Tina and Gabe were married 11 October 2003 in uh, America. As part of their honeymoon, they travelled to Australia and boarded the Spoil Sport to go scuba diving at the shipwreck of the Yongala off Townsville. I first met Tina and Gabe on the night prior to that particular dive. All the guests come on board and they have to have an interview with me. We established that Gabe was a rescue diver, 50 or so dives under the belt, so a competent, capable diver. Tina was a relatively new diver was suggested that we take Tina for an orientation dive, but they were quite adamant that they were happy to dive together and didn't need the, the orientation dive as such. On that particular morning, October 22nd, 2003, the weather conditions were very good. Our only issue, I suppose, that we had in question was the current. There was a strong current down there. After breakfast, Wade Singleton uh, assembled everyone and took us through a dive briefing and explained um, virtually everything about the dive. I offered the orientation dive to Gabe and Tina again, but they refused that one. They then went for their dive, and a short time later they were back on deck. Apparently Gabe had some issues with his dive computer. And then once they'd got that fixed, they were ready for their second dive. And by that time, the current had substantially decreased. And Gabe and Tina submerged approximately 30 seconds before myself and my group did. I was in the water for about six or seven minutes when I saw a diver lying away from the wreck on the seafloor. It all happened very quickly, but the, the thought processes were, what's the diver doing? Where's their buddy? No bubbles, and it was at that Point that I realised that something wasn't quite right and that's when I just hightailed over to the person and made out that it was Tina. So I scooped her up and then swam to the surface as fast as possible. We were up on the back of the deck getting our stuff ready to go in for a second dive and Ken noticed that Gabe was without Tina and looking kind of flustered and disturbed. I went up to him and said, Gabe, what's going on? And where's Tina? And he said, she, she didn't come up. And I said, Gabe, what happened? And he said she was overweighted and panicking and was flailing and knocked his mask off and knocked the regulator out of his mouth. He said, by the time I got that back, she was sinking, hands towards me, feet first sinking, um, staring at me. And I said, Gabe, you left her. And he said, I had to get assistance. And I, I stared at Gabe for a long time and I said, Gabe, that didn't happen. You never, ever, ever leave a diver in that situation. You just don't. None of his story made sense to an experienced diver. Once we hit the surface, we got Tina onto another vessel and we started first aid CPR. I think there's about four or five of us. There was a couple of emergency room doctors. We were just doing whatever we could to, to give her the best chance of survival. It was decided not to proceed any further after you know, 40, 45 minutes. Dr. John Downey came in and Gabe said, is she okay? John, is she okay? And, and John just said, no, she didn't make it. And at that point, um, we all just grabbed onto each other and just fell down. On the evening of the 22nd, myself and Detective Geringer we had to obtain statements from the people off both vessels. Detective Geringer took a uh, type statement from uh, Gabe. Gabe told me that he and Tina entered the water 
and that as a result of a malfunction with his dive computer, they had to abort the first dive. A short time later, they've re-entered the water a second time, and at about 15 metres depth, Tina's indicated that she wanted to resurface. They've started swimming back to the diver access point, and at some stage, Tina has panicked and knocked off his mask and regulator. Gabe's had to let Tina go and fix himself up. He's then noticed that she's some five or ten feet below him. He starts to swim down, but realises there's nothing that he can do. As a result, he starts to surface. On the way up, he bumps into two divers and has problems communicating with them that there's a difficulty. He then continued to the surface where he raised the alarm. As far as suspicion was concerned, I myself am not a diver. Whilst I thought it unusual for him to leave his wife of 11 days, people do do strange things when they're panicked. It was October the 22nd here. It was 8.36 in the morning. I'll never forget the time. Uh, my cell phone rang, and it was Gabe's father, David Watson. And he said, I don't know any other way of telling you this. There's been an accident. Tina drowned. Here's my preacher. I was just devastated. I, I, I actually physically went to my knees in the middle of the room. When Gabe gets on the phone, he tells us that initial story. My wife, Cindy, said, well, did you go over to be with her? Were you calling her name while they were trying to resuscitate her? And, and Gabe said, yes. I, I went over. I was trying to get her to come back but we just lost her. I didn't know anything about diving, and I thought to myself, well, you know, he, he might have left out that he panicked and left her, but, but it was all, in my mind at that time, a terrible accident. Several days later, Gabe indicated to me that he wished to clarify a few matters. In his first statement, Gabe mentioned that the currents were a little above mild, five out of ten. In his second statement, he made mention that they were the strongest currents that he'd ever experienced himself. And as far as he was concerned, it was the currents that triggered Tina's distress. I just can't help but think that that the fight against the current is what allowed whatever thing took place that caused her to either black out or whatever and sink. Oh, neither yourself nor, nor Tina were off at an orientation dive or... Okay. No, Gabe also made mention in his second statement that in no way did his diver rescue certification train him to bring an unconscious diver to the surface. There was nothing in our thing about how to get somebody... To it seemed to me as if there was some blame shifting going on, but at that stage there was no suspicions of, of any foul play, so Gabe was allowed to leave the country to bury his wife. After the funeral, I tried my very best to stay friends with Gabe you know, until I got that Christmas card. It was a picture of the two of them from their wedding. On the inside of it, it said, who's that sexy guy next to Tina? Oh yeah, that's me. And he put a smiley face on it. I just threw it down on the countertop in disgust and I said, there's something weird going on here. When we got back into Florida, we were troubled by the events that happened. And I said, Paul, I'm going to call and try to get in touch with her parents. He comes in, and then we had a conversation about what he knew had happened. And really, pretty much took Gabe's story apart. What really rang one of the loudest bells is when Gabe said she was 10 feet below him, arms outstretched and sinking, looking up at him. I said, Tommy, this is difficult because I've never heard of a diver in a full out panic mode sinking serenely to the bottom of the ocean. A full born panic attack in a diver will make that diver crawl right over the top of someone to get to the surface. And my experience tells me that live people don't sink, dead people sink. And that really changed everything. 
when he said that. And two days later, Gage sent in word through his attorney that because he was her husband, even though they'd only been married 10 days, that he had a right to all of her stuff and I needed to get it all together as quickly as I could and turn it over to him like right now. I made a decision that week that we had to go to Australia because I had to go see the police firsthand if I could and I needed somehow or other to meet the guy that brought her up. Admittedly, I uh, was apprehensive about the meeting, but he, he was fantastic and all he was after was facts about what had happened. One of those was he wanted to know if Gabe had actually come across to Tina while we were doing resuscitation on her. I was able to tell him that he didn't come across, he actually stayed on the other boat while that was happening. Why, if you're on this boat and she's on a boat just over there, why are you not going over there to her? Because anybody else would. And why, once somebody comes back and tells you she's dead, would all of a sudden you go over? Now, the only reason he wouldn't go over there while they were trying to resuscitate her is he was afraid they would. And she knew what he had tried to do to her. And once he knew she was dead, it didn't matter. I did get to have several conversations with the police. They were indeed suspicious and in that it was a continuing, ongoing investigation. The autopsy of Tina revealed that she had died of drowning, but the causation of the drowning was undetermined. 197, it's games. But oxygen deprivation was a possibility under the circumstances, a real possibility. The autopsy eliminated any medical condition. It eliminated any sort of death from uh, marine stings. And also all of Tina's equipment had been tested and found to be operating correctly. So that left open the question, what was the cause of her drowning? Detective Geringer and I sat down and broke down the record of interview and statement of Gabe, uh, literally at times down to individual lines and phrases, and to clearly establish what he alleges occurred underwater. I started to go down just a couple feet under the water. My computer beeped at me. Uh, we initially started with his dive computer and his version in relation to it giving out an audible alarm when he first descended with Tina. You know, he got me a coin, I pulled the battery out, swapped it around, hooked it back up, and I said, you know, don't tell anybody, but I had my battery in backwards. We carried out tests on the dive computer in the hyperbaric chamber, both with the batteries in correctly and with them in incorrectly. And what we found is that with the battery in back the front, the computer merely doesn't work. It's unable to put out an audible alarm. His actions in relation to the dive computer were a straight out lie and that then raised a the question with us, what was he trying to hide? So I knew you know, that that was the problem. And the next prominent point was Gabe's statement that Tina was sinking quicker than he could keep up to her. She had both her arms up and she was looking up before I realised she was going down faster than I could catch up with her. You know, that's when I decided, well, I'm going to go get somebody that maybe knows what to do. Obviously, we sought the opinion of a number of expert divers, and all of them stated that Gabe could have reached Tina very easily, in fact, just with a couple of kicks of his fins. And we also did research into his rescue qualifications. And what we found is that he had been trained in bringing unconscious divers to the surface. So we realised that Gabe had manifestly downplayed his qualifications in relation to his rescue certification. That would be the stack with the mast, yes? Yep. We also came into possession of a photograph taken by another diver, a Mr Stempler, and he's taking a photograph of his wife. In the background you can see Wade Singleton diving in the direction of Tina lying on the ocean floor. Yeah, it's one of them photographs, I think, that's one in a million. We had a specific location on the ocean floor where Tina was photographed. The significance of that is that it contradicted what Gabe had told us about where he had left Tina. Tina's body should have been found on the wreck or adjacent to it, not 16 metres away from the wreck, 
at a 90 degree angle to the currents. Specific reference to these two people that he bumps into on the ascent line. He also mentioned in his statement that after he left Tina, he encountered two divers. And he was quite direct and quite uh, firm in that he substantially shook these divers, pointed in the direction that he'd last seen Tina, trying to raise the alarm. I remember shouting through my regulator, Tina, 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 tapping on. I know the guy turned around and looked at me and I was pointing, you know, where she went down. We contacted uh, every crew and passenger on both vessels that were moored at that location on the day of the death. And there was nobody that had a single male diver approach them on the diver descent line and try and raise an alarm with them. One of the really big things that we focused on was Gabe's version where he said he rocketed to the surface to seek help for Tina. Pretty much just rocketed to the top, you know, just swam up to the top. I've probably never swam so fast in my life. You know, I'm amazed that I didn't jump at the bins or something. Here we've got the uh, approximate dive profile of Gabe. When we compared it to the results that had come back from his dive computer, we found that Gabe had only descended to 15 metres and it took him between two and three minutes to reach the surface to raise a call for help. Speaking to various people in the dive industry, um, that was classed by some as literally pedestrian under the given circumstances. We compared that dive profile of Gabe's to the dive profile of Wade Singleton. Wade Singleton had gone to twice the depth and from the point that he has picked up Tina on the ocean floor and gone to the surface, he has covered twice the distance in nearly half the time. In addition to that, he was carrying Tina, who was not assisting in her own ascent. That's a rocket to the surface. Wade's gone effectively twice the distance in half the time. That raised major concerns for Detective Geringer and I. I got assigned this case during my first week as a detective. I was real dismissive about it at first. I said, you know, there's no way there's anything to this. I'll just call up the, the Australians and find out, you know, what I can for the family and that'll be it. And you know, look at it, almost seven years later, here we are. In mid to late 2005, we had discussions with Brad Flynn at the Helena Police Department, and we undertook the process of a mutual assistance agreement for him to speak further to witnesses. Brad also assisted us with some of the uh, unusual behaviour uh, that Gabe undertook upon his return to America. In speaking to the Thomases, there was a lot of tension with their relationship with Gabe and his family. Mr. Thomas had started telling me that for some unknown reason, the flowers that his family was placing on the grave were mysteriously disappearing. Every week I come in on the weekends, I put flowers there. By Monday or Tuesday, they're gone. We were pretty suspicious of, 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 of it being him, but the fact of the matter is, why would he do such a thing? It just didn't make sense. I get a phone call shortly thereafter that Gabe had served notice that he wanted Tina moved. And what? Why would you want to exhume your recently dead wife's body? You know, why? Well, he wants to put it in a plot that he owns. Okay, where is the plot that he owns? About 100 yards away. I had to go to the, to the cemetery and, and videotape it. It was a cold, blustery, rainy day. And it was like there was a higher power saying, I am not happy with what's happening here. The day that that happened was one of the worst days of my life. Gabe didn't come. His father showed up with his friend and the two of them just kind of nonchalantly sat around while my daughter was dug up, loaded on the back of a dump truck and moved. 
my thoughts kept thinking, God, Tina, I cannot believe if you're there and you're watching that you're having to see this. After she was moved to the, the other plot, the flowers continued mysteriously disappearing. These are the flowers that the Thomas family has placed on the grave of Christina. And Mr. Thomas has also gone to the extent of uh, chaining them with a bike lock to the grave. I needed to know who was doing it. So I set up a surveillance operation in the cemetery about 50 yards away and camped out for a couple of days and waited and waited and waited and finally I got what I expected. And Gabe Watson has just arrived. Gabe pulls out a set of three foot bolt cutters, spends the next 10 minutes working on the cable. Finally you can see him pull the stake up and grab the flowers, tosses them in the street, tosses the cable in a garbage can and drives away. And I was just numb. Uh, every emotion in my body it was it's exploding. These are the flowers that he removed. Does looking at that video make me say that Gabe Watson killed her? No, I can't say that. Does looking at that video make me think that his priorities are way out of line and that obviously there are some deep-seated animosity and hatred towards the Thomas family that maybe we underestimated? Absolutely. Does it make me look at him from a different perspective? You better believe it. When we first embarked on this investigation, my initial thoughts were that it was just a tragic drowning. And we spent a couple of years investigating, and as much as we followed the evidence, we couldn't corroborate Gabe's version. We kept coming up with all these lies from Gabe, and our suspicions were growing substantially to the point that we believed that Gabe Watson had murdered Tina Thomas on their honeymoon at the shipwreck SS Yongala. I recall his hands being around her back. Never in his statements did Gabe ever state that he had her in a bear hug. It's utter nonsense to think he would do something like this. The husband of a young bride who drowned on the Great Barrier Reef has been charged with her murder. He said, well, Gabe Watson got off the plane in Brisbane this morning, and he is under arrest. And I said, what in the hell have y'all done? I think it's clear a deal was done. Now it's my turn. I'm going to see what I can do in my backyard. I don't believe that a man who drowns his wife should, should be shown leniency. I hope that Tina gets her day in court, and we get the justice that she deserves. We continue our story about young American bride Tina Watson, who died seven years ago on her honeymoon while scuba diving with her husband on the Great Barrier Reef. Gabe Watson, her husband, was charged with murder, but convicted only of manslaughter, sparking controversy over the role of the Queensland prosecutors. Tina Watson's parents and authorities in her home state of Alabama have refused to let the case rest and Gabe Watson could still face another trial back home in the United States. In a moment, the story continues, but first, this recap. I truly felt like he wouldn't take care of her the way that she deserved to be taken care of. 
Hi, Gabe. Hi, Gabe. Choose you, Tina. Choose you, Tina. I saw a diver lying away from the wreck. I scooped her up and then swam to the surface as fast as possible. Gabe said, is she okay? And John just said, no, she didn't make it. She had both her arms up and she was looking up. You never, ever leave a diver in that situation. None of his story made sense to an experienced diver. We initially started with his dive computer. My computer beeped at me. I had my battery in backwards. And what we found is that with the battery in back to front, the computer merely doesn't work. Stack with the mask, yes. We also came into possession of a photograph of Tina lying on the ocean floor. That it contradicted what Gabe had told us about where he had left Tina. He said he rocketed to the surface to seek help. I've probably never swam so fast in my life. It took him between two and three minutes. That was classed by some as literally pedestrian. Gabe wanted Tina moved. Gabe Watson has just arrived. The flowers continued mysteriously disappearing. We believed that Gabe Watson had murdered Tina Thomas on their honeymoon at the shipwreck SS Yongala. Tina died in October 2003, but the investigation into Tina's death was very complex and protracted and spanned several years. We had to track down every witness that was at the Yongala on that day, and those witnesses were now scattered uh, in a number of different countries all around the globe. Somewhere in here he talks about his... And in the process of that, we had a major breakthrough in the case. We'd finally found an eyewitness. I can talk to each and every one of those witnesses. Dr Stanley Stutz was one of the doctors who attempted to revive Tina when she'd been brought to the surface. Stutz, my full name is Stanley John Stutz. Dr Stutz told us that he had seen an interaction between two divers under the water. The diver one, you, there's no doubt in your mind that was the deceased? Definitely, okay. We then were able to establish that the only two divers that could have been were Tina and Gabe. She looked in distress and fearful and moving arms and legs. And then I saw him come into the picture uh, and came sort of on top of her, uh, put his arms around her. Mm -hmm. He observed Gabe embrace Tina in the middle section of her back. I recall his hands being around her back uh, and they were together uh, for uh, probably what seemed like maybe 30 seconds. Was hard he said that he saw the two divers separate with the larger diver, Gabe, ascending and Tina sinking to the bottom. She was still moving, but sort of uh, was moving less and less. Okay. Uh, and as she was floating in the bottom, I mean, I could mimic it. Yeah. It was basically something like this. Stutz did know what he saw was odd, and he tried to raise the alarm. However, was instructed to stay with the dive group. We just wanted to add that to the official... Uh, when I went and interviewed Dr. Stutz, he was very adamant about what he saw. So that was huge in our part because never in his statements did Gabe ever state that he was had her in a bear hug. She was, he was always at arm's length with her, um, nothing any of that sort. So that was a, a very vital piece of evidence to us. After we'd carefully examined all the evidence, a theory started to develop. I believe Gabe claimed that there was a problem with his dive computer to get Tina back out of the water and back to the spoil sport. That enabled the majority of the divers to progress through the dive site. And thereby, there were fewer witnesses to what was going to unfold. When they re-entered the water, Gabe has taken Tina far enough away out of what he perceived to be the visible range of other divers I believe Gabe has pulled Tina face first onto his chest and from there he has turned her air off. I believe she has fought back and probably one of the few truths that Gabe has said underwater, she did damage some of his uh, diving gear, um, has probably dislodged his mask and or regulator. In a very short time though, she has been rendered unconscious. 
He then realises that he has to turn her air back on and he swims down onto her descending body. And this is the observations of Stutz and Gabe turns the air tank back on. We tested our theory that someone of Gabe's build could embrace someone of Tina's build and turn off or on the air tank and we determined that it could be done. The wreck resting on the ocean floor at a depth of about 30 metres. We thought we could show the means and opportunity in which Gabe had taken Tina's life, but we thought that we were lacking substantially in, in a motive. That's right. There was a need for Queensland detectives to come here. But when we started to present that, to some of the superiors down there, there was a lot of reluctance that this was just a tragic accident. It took several years of Gary and Kevin pushing and pushing and pushing, not giving up. We finally got the approval that they needed to be able to say, okay, look, we believe it does deserve a good hard second look, go do it. When we were conducting inquiries in America, we came across uh, several witnesses who had seen some, for want of a better word, low-level forms of domestic violence in the sense that they never viewed any physical assaults, but controlling behaviour. They were at a, a pizza shop one day and Tina hadn't done exactly what Gabe had wanted and uh, he entered into the pizza shop and uh, picked up some pizza and threw it at her. The information we had from various witnesses was that Gabe had purchased an engagement wing, had told her about it, had even shown her where it was sitting inside his unit and told her she wasn't allowed to have it until uh, basically he was ready to give it to her. He tells her if she looks in the bag, he's gonna take it back. <laughs> and when she first told me about that, I said, tell him to take it back. Tell him to do whatever you wanna do. He wants to do with it. Why should you care? Don't let him do that. For whatever reason, she let him whether it was because of the fact that she'd been a bridesmaid at all of her friends' wedding, her sister's wedding, to a point where she was telling me, Daddy, you know, I guess I'm just going to be an old maid and I'm going to live downstairs. And finally, it got to the point where she was like, I don't, I don't know where we are right now. I'm not really happy with it. You tell them about dinner? And that was about the same time when my cousin was living in Atlanta and they had always kind of been attracted to each other. That was her saying, I'm okay, don't worry about me. And I had mentioned, well, you know, Xander's living in Atlanta, you could go and, you know, just see how it, how it would work out. Yeah. She went to see Xander for the weekend and, you know, she discovered that it wasn't gonna work out for them. Right. Gabe ended up finding out and, um, and uh, his reaction to that uh, was apparently not good. And I don't think it was more than two weeks later that he proposed to her at Easter. I asked her if, if she was really happy. And she took him in and she said, yeah, I, think, I guess so. We asked ourselves a question whether that weekend away with Tina and Xander, if it was a motive for what occurred, but we will never know. One of the other potential motives we explored was insurance. In the weeks leading up to the wedding, Tina has come home and seen her father, Tommy Thomas. And she said, Gabe is wanting me to can increase my group life insurance it up to the maximum and change the beneficiary to him. And she said, and right now, she said, I just, I don't have time to do that with all the other stuff going on. And I said, well, just tell him that you took care of it. And we'll take care of it, okay, when you get back. And the inference being when they get on the plane to come to Australia, Gabe is under the belief that he's the beneficiary uh, to his wife's insurance in the event of her death. We went and spoke to her employer. Gabe had come to their office following his return from Australia and was inquiring about insurance. They said he was not entitled to any and he was unhappy. 
over the information that he'd received. $160,000, um, for some people that could be enough motive to, uh, to take someone else's life. The inquest commenced on the 19th of November 2007. Mr Watson didn't appear before the inquiry. It was clear that this whole case was one based on circumstantial evidence. There was no clear, definite evidence of murder. Gabe's defence lawyers raised with the coroner the issue that Detective Campbell and I had had a preconceived idea that Gabe was guilty of Tina's death and that we'd gone out after him. I have to say that I thought it was a very thorough and complete investigation and is as impartial an investigation as I've seen. Mr Watson's counsel submitted there were four possible medical reasons which would explain the drowning. Now firstly, she had suffered a pre-existing condition, a heart condition, and the evidence from her specialist were that that had been corrected and that was not a factor causing her death. Secondly, there was a suspicion that it could have been caused by vomiting. There was no evidence that uh, that had obstructed her, her airway or the third matter where the vocal cords would have closed as a result of that obstruction. There was no evidence of that. And the final matter that panic could have resulted in her drowning. I was satisfied that none of them, or even a combination of them, was a sufficient explanation for her drowning. But I deliberated quite a lengthy time and I came to the conclusion that there was sufficient evidence there that a jury, if they looked at it, they could come to a conclusion that there had been an intent and that the man had deliberately murdered his partner. It was like, thank you God, somebody else that has more credibility than me says, you know what? It's not wasted time. I believe you. I believe that there's something here. Gabe got charged with murder in June, and two months later, after a brief, from what I understand, one or two week engagement, he gets married. I'm sure she's a very good person, but I suspect that she doesn't know all the facts of the case. I got the call and I was told that they had indicted him. I did not believe that there was anything that would now prevent my daughter getting the justice she deserved in a court. And that was a foolish mistake on my part. On the 13th of May, 2009, Detective Geringer and I were at the Brisbane airport when Gabe uh, hopped off a flight from Los Angeles. He uh, surrendered himself into custody. I get a call from the Department of Public Prosecutions. He goes, Tommy, I've got some good news. He said, well, Gabe Watson got off a plane in Brisbane this morning, and he is under arrest. And I said, what in the hell have y'all done? And he said, what? I said, what kind of deal have y'all made? I had gotten no indication from the, from the DPP that that was even a possibility that he was going to get on a plane and come over on his own. His attorneys had indicated all along that he would fight extradition to the very end. All of a sudden, what changed? And I just couldn't help but believe that there had to be some kind of deal made. I get a call, just as we anticipated. They've asked us to consider a manslaughter plea. We've already got them locked in. And I said, look, we don't, we don't support it in no way, form, or fashion. All we want is what 
he was charged for and what he was indicted for. We want that to go to court in front of a jury with the evidence presented just like it should be. We knew that it was out of our hands. The decision had already been made. Damn what the family thought. Damn what the police thought. This was going to be a moral victory for the DPP. They could chalk it up as a, as a conviction. And we can put that money towards other Australian interests and uh, forget about everybody. And I knew that that's what was going to happen. When we went into court, we still had this, this hope in our mind that the judge would see through it, that he would dismiss it and say we had to go to trial. When Gabe Watson appeared in court that morning, the indictment read murder. But it's obvious from the words used that he knew that the DPP would accept an alternative charge of manslaughter. And he actually said, not guilty to murder, guilty to manslaughter. And immediately following that, the prosecution accepted uh, that plea. Obviously, the Crown Prosecutor was then prevented from putting any evidence to the court that he deliberately killed her. Instead, the basis of their case was that he'd failed in his duty to her as her dive body and just left her to die. Failure to render aid to a dive buddy? I mean, you've got to be kidding me. To me, it was equivalent to taking a homicide and convicting him of jaywalking. In Gabe's defense, his lawyer basically took the line that, that Gabe had panicked, that he'd had a split second in which to make a decision and had made the wrong one. The judge then had to pass sentence on, on Gabe Watson and he took a lot of mitigating factors into account. One was the belief that um, Watson had come back voluntarily from America, still thinking he faced a murder charge. The judge said that he can understand that, that, that Gabe is very upset, that um, it must, it's obviously been very hard on him, uh, you know, that, that he should be commended for returning to Australia. I mean, are you, you've got to be kidding me. Let's pat him on the back and thank him for coming back and pleading guilty to manslaughter. Hell, let's give him a cake with candles on it. I'm not surprised that the judge came back with the decision that he came back with because he didn't hear any of the evidence. He didn't have anything else to go on. At the end of the day, he gets sentenced with 12 months <laughs> minimum to serve. The four, four and a half year head sentence didn't really make any difference whatsoever. There's public outrage by the Australian public. The sentence was appealed, no new evidence was, was entered, and he is serving an 18-month minimum sentence. And so he's not serving a minutes more time than what he was anticipating serving when he got on a plane to go over there. There is a belief that, that he only came back to Australia because the deal had already been done. That in itself isn't a bad thing if the evidence only pointed to manslaughter. Uh, what would be a bad thing, of course, is if the charge had been reduced to manslaughter when in fact they could have proved murder. The coroner thought that the man should be committed for murder, but the coroner only had to be satisfied that a jury could convict. The DPP has to look at it from a, a broader perspective. If there are no reasonable prospects of a conviction, you don't waste public money prosecuting. And what they would, would have to prove was that he intended to kill her. And that, that's a, a very difficult thing to prove. But clearly, public opinion is swinging towards the fact, well, the DPP should have produced all the evidence they had and allowed a jury to make its own decision. sense that their yeah. primary concern would be for him. I remember when we got back from the sentencing, Monumental. Tommy and I looked at each other and said, I'm not done. We're not done. There's no reason why they can't get it to us. Now it's my turn. I'm going to see what I can do in my backyard with my rules, with my people behind me, and let's see where we go. You sent me the Department of Justice's response. That's right. Department of Justice um, personnel 
have contacted their counterparts in Australia. Troy King, our Attorney General in the state of Alabama, he basically stepped out and said, we're going to make sure that we get justice for a citizen of the state of Alabama uh, because we're going to do everything we can to move for a grand jury indictment on capital murder charges when he gets back here. I agree with you. Everything that, that can be done needs to be done. I don't believe that a man who drowns his wife should be shown leniency. And that's what, it is my perception, happened. I think we need to go ahead and make arrangements with our investigators. And what we're seeking to do is to protect Tina, and not just to protect Tina, but to honor her memory with a just sentence. I don't believe she got that in Australia. And I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure she does get it back at home in Alabama. I'm very uncomfortable at the prospect that having served a sentence of imprisonment on an agreed criminal charge here in Queensland, that he now has to face prosecution all over again for the very same thing. It, it strikes it a principle of no double jeopardy. You can't be punished twice for the same thing. Alabama's a separate sovereign state, so there is no double jeopardy that attaches. I'm not seeking to prosecute him on the same charges that he was prosecuted on in Australia. I seek to prosecute him for charges that began in Alabama, if that's what the evidence shows. What I'm looking at is, even though the actual death occurred in Australia, if any elements of the crime were planned here, conspired here, and executed here, then he, we may be able to hold him criminally responsible for that. Well, right now they're saying that uh, if he's released, they're probably going to end up keeping him. We are very confident that there definitely is a case in the Watson situation, although we're unfortunately unable to tell you about the motives and, and the background of the case and the evidence that would be put forward to a jury. It definitely does exist. Had some um, developments that Brad has found out. Um, Every jury in Alabama, in my opinion, could see how this case went down how it started here, culminated off the barrier reef where Tina died. Now, can I promise you 100%? No prosecutor can. You want a percentage? I'd say I'm 85% convinced that I can win this case to a jury. Murder or tragic incident? Should Tina Watson's husband stand trial for murder in Alabama? It's, it's utter nonsense to think he would do something like this. He made the wrong decision by going up to get help as opposed to staying with her at the bottom. Our, our focus right now is an attempt to recover the information that Australia collected in its own investigation and to share it as law enforcement agencies should. They have the dive tanks, the, the witness statements. They have many of the things that we need to conduct an investigation. But the Australian authorities are refusing to cooperate. If Gabe Watson is prosecuted for murder in Alabama, he could face the death penalty. Queensland, like everywhere else in Australia, is officially set against the death penalty. Because of that, the Queensland Attorney General is refusing to hand over any evidence that could lead uh, to Mr. Watson's conviction. Well, they're saying now that if we still refuse to budge on the death penalty, that they want to keep him, and they're going to allow him to stay in Queensland. If that's their position, then Attorney General Troy King's going to have to make the decision whether or not to remove the death penalty uh, permanently. What I detect is that the, the folks that are running the Attorney General's office in Queensland appear to me to be obstructing a criminal process and interfering and taking sides with a man who it appears to many people in Alabama may have killed his wife. But we're scared to death. Uh, that that keeps me awake at night. But now, Troy King, without knowing anything about the case, wants to put my son to death. It's time to speak out. Alabama is not a barbaric state that's looking to execute innocent people. Alabama is a justice-loving state that believes when its citizens are harmed, the people who are responsible should face a just sentence in a court of law. Obstacles and hurdles thrown up one after another. I don't think Gabe Watson will get justice in Alabama because I think far too many people have already made their mind up that he's guilty of murder. And the Attorney General, who is of course popularly elected, is just going along with that.
a plea bargain that doesn't serve the interest of justice given a reason to now turn a blind eye on. Perhaps at the end of the day, Mr. Watson may regret that he was only convicted of manslaughter in this country and has left the door open to a murder prosecution in Alabama. I still struggle. Lasko said it was sufficient for him to go to trial for murder. I believe we got as close to the truth as we could. I don't think we could have taken it any further. And I believe the coroner handed down the right decision. I would still like to think that he did not deliberately murder her. But I would have liked to see the trial go forward. I would have liked to hear him give his explanation, his side of the story, other than, the, you know, he has had nothing to say. I think Gabe lied. I think it's obvious. The last time that I saw her was at the end of the wedding reception. I ran to the elevator and actually got my arm stuck in the door to force it back open so I could just grab her one more time. And I told her I loved her. And then I looked at Gabe and I touched his arm and I said, take care of my little girl. And, uh, and that's the last few seconds that I had with her. Station on Monday, the 27th of October 2003. Other persons present are Gabe Watson and uh, his mother. Well, when Detective Garinger and I were assigned the investigation, I could not see how Tina's death would be suspicious. Tina's gone down, I need help. Tina's gone down, I need help. Gabe was married only 11 days to Tina, so we seemed quite happy with each other. But basically, we, we kept coming back to the point there was no reasonable hypothesis as to why. Tina died underwater on that given day. The doctor said oh, I did everything I could, but we lost her. We were looking for innocent explanations, but at the end of the day, there were just too many lies, too many inconsistencies. I honestly think that just prior to her death, um, she was fighting for her life. Tina was just the most beautiful girl, both inside and out. She could when I saw a diver lying away from the wreck on the seafloor, it all happened very quickly, but the, the thought processes were, what's the diver doing? Where's their buddy? No bubbles. And it was at that point that I realized that something wasn't quite right. And that's when I just hightailed over to the person and made out that it was Tina. I scooped her up and then swam to the surface as fast as possible. We were up on the back of the deck getting our stuff ready to go in for a second dive and Ken noticed that Gabe was without Tina and looking kind of flustered and disturbed. I went up to him and said, Gabe, what's going on? And where's Tina? And he said, she, she didn't come up. And I said, Gabe, what happened? And he said she was overweighted and panicking and was flailing and knocked his mask off and knocked the regulator out of his mouth. He said, by the time I got that back, she was sinking, hands towards me, feet first sinking, um, staring at me. And I said, Gabe, you left her. And he said, I had to get assistance. And I, I stared at Gabe for a long time and I said, Gabe, that didn't happen. You never, ever, ever leave a diver in that situation. You just don't. None of his story made sense to an experienced diver. Once we hit the surface, we got Tina onto another vessel and we started first aid CPR. 
Hello, I'm Caroline Jones. It's seven years now since a young American woman died while scuba diving with her husband on the Great Barrier Reef. Tina and Gabe Watson were on their honeymoon. Yet, after a tenacious police investigation, Gabe Watson was charged with his wife's murder. What happened next sparked public anger, both here and in the United States, with ongoing disquiet about the role of the prosecutors. It remains a baffling case, and tonight, for the first time, the detectives involved outline the evidence against Gabe Watson. This is the story of Tina Watson. It was a beautiful day, uh, the day that she got married. Tina and I had a very nice conversation on the way to the church. I told her over and over how much that I loved her and that I wanted her to be happy. Uh, I also told her that if she had any doubts about this, she didn't have to do it. Do you, Gabe and Tina? And she told me, she said, Dad, this is going to be a good day. This is what I want. will bind you as husband and wife. So I think I cried from then until all the way through the wedding. Hi, Gabe. Hi, Gabe. Choose you, Tina. Choose you, Tina. From this I just had this fear, this uncomfortable feeling that even though she had said she was sure that she wasn't. And I truly felt like he wouldn't take care of her the way that she deserved to be taken care of. Tina and Gabe were married 11 October 2003 in uh, America. As part of their honeymoon, they travelled to Australia and boarded the Spoil Sport to go scuba diving at the shipwreck of the Yongala off Townsville. I first met Tina and Gabe on the night prior to that particular dive. All the guests come on board and they have to have an interview with me. We established that Gabe was a rescue diver, 50 or so dives under the belt, so a competent, capable diver. Tina was a relatively new diver was suggested that we take Tina for an orientation dive, but they were quite adamant that they were happy to dive together and didn't need the, the orientation dive as such. On that particular morning, October 22nd, 2003, the weather conditions were very good. Our only issue, I suppose, that we had in question was the current. There was a strong current down there. After breakfast, Wade Singleton uh, assembled everyone and took us through a dive briefing and explained um, virtually everything about the dive. I offered the orientation dive to Gabe and Tina again, but they refused that one. They then went for their dive, and a short time later they were back on deck. Apparently Gabe had some issues with his dive computer. And then once they got that fixed, they were ready for their second dive. And by that time, the current had substantially decreased. And Gabe and Tina submerged at approximately 30 seconds before myself and my group did. I was in the water for about six or seven minutes. Walk into a room and, and just light the whole place up. You know, she loved life and she made life fun. Uh, she made life fun for all of us. <laughs> Tina met Gabe in classes at college, probably together about a year before they got engaged. He worked for his dad as a salesman for the cardboard company. One day when we're sitting in the rocking chairs on the front porch at the uh, rest stop, <laughs> wiping the drool off each other's chins, I can't think of anybody else ever. So when she said she was taking up scuba diving, I was like, crazy lady, say what? <laughs> because her hair stayed wet for so long, she didn't like getting it wet. <laughs> when we would go swimming in high school, she'd be doing this really crazy dog paddle swim <laughs> just so that her head would stay above the water. I had talked to him about my concern about the diving lessons, about the fact that she had had, uh, you know, a heart problem as a child. And he said if Tina wanted him to do the things that, that she liked to do, that she had to do the things that he wanted to do, and he liked to dive, so she needed to dive with him. 
I have to get before shots in case we get eaten by a shark. For the honeymoon, he wanted to go to Australia and see the turtles and go scuba diving. She thought that would be exciting. Tell the camera bye. Bye, camera. Blow the camera a kissy. But it certainly wasn't the first place I would have expected her to pick. Tina, where are we going? We're going to the Zane. Oh, yeah. 